night, Megan Watson and Megan Reismeyer. Am I saying that properly? Thank you uh, for joining us on our program on family law. Uh, this is really special that we can have both of you on. So I, I know that you know time is precious right now. And I know that after a long day of, of a real intense job to then have to do a Zoom program at, at night is, is difficult. I, we all, it's been a year living like this. So I really do appreciate your time. Um, I want you to know that Megan, Megan Watson is an attorney in Philadelphia, a partner at Berner Paul and Watson, and she does family law. She has, is a member of PMC's board, and she's been a great resource for me personally um, over the years, and I very much appreciate it. Megan Reismeyer, I want to thank you so very much for last minute, and I really do mean that, uh, assisting us. She is a professor of clinical law and director of the Community Law Clinic at Dickinson Law School. And we look forward to working with you in, in many different ways going forward. So um, PMC stands for Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. We've been in existence for over 30 years. Uh, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit uh, in Pennsylvania. We are dedicated to assuring that the justice system in which everyone participates is fair, equal, accessible, impartial, and has qualified judges. And I think we're gonna give you a, show a PowerPoint presentation uh, on, on family law and uh, afterwards, or even during, if there are any questions, you know, during, put the questions in the chat. Afterwards, we can have a, you know, a, 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 we can actually answer any questions. So Megan, do you want to uh, share no. your screen? Is that working? Yep, you are good. Okay, great. And I wanna say thank you for Megan to joining us too. As Debbie said, I practice primarily in Philly in those counties. So I'm very, very thankful because she has the local knowledge that she's able to join us tonight and help with that. So we are going to um, talk about family court. Uh, family court is within the Court of Common Pleas um, in all our jurisdictions. Uh, basically, family court can encompass custody, support, divorce, abuse, adoption, dependency. Um, wh where I'm from in Philly, it's broken down into two departments of domestic relations and um, juvenile work. Um, in the smaller counties, I know it's not broken down so much uh, because there's just not the amount of cases as there are in Philadelphia um, and some of the bigger counties. So the domestic relations, if I say that, what I mean by that is custody, support, and divorce for tonight's purposes. Those are the three areas that we are gonna talk about. Um, for your information, for anyone looking at the, looking at the slideshow, uh, the information for the Cumberland County Courthouse is identified here on the slideshow. Um, I do know, uh, Megan was telling me that it's also, is it Franklin County, Megan? Yes, Shippensburg is, also... is, shares Cumberland and Franklin, yeah. Okay, so um, can you share the information? I know it's not on the slide, but where, uh, where Franklin um, County Courthouse might be located? Yes, it's in uh, Chambersburg. It's on um, Route 30, which is Lincoln Way East, and I'm, Pull it. I I didn't pull up the. Um, Sorry, I put you on. That's the okay. The courthouse is at 157 Lincoln Way East in Chambersburg, uh, and in fact, the courthouse in Carlisle is at the is on the square. It's one courthouse square, and this is a picture of the um, hearing the divorce hearing officer and this and domestic relations, which is the support office in Cumberland County. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So as I said, we're gonna talk about divorce, a little bit about spousal support. We'll talk about child support, custody. Um, if we have time, we'll get into dependency court and juvenile issues, but uh, we might not have time to get there. And I wanna make sure to have time for anyone's questions. So with regard to divorce, um, there are two kinds of divorce in Pennsylvania. There's a no fault based, there's a fault based divorce and a no fault divorce. Most cases proceed 
under no fault because fault divorces can be very expensive and very time consuming. And recently, well, not that recently, I guess, years ago, we updated our fault grounds to make it a little bit easier um, to, to proceed for divorce under fault grounds. And so if you're looking at the statute, uh, statutes have sections. These are the numbers that we're referring to. The section in the statute for the no-fault divorces are 3301 and it's C and D. So the two types of um, no-fault divorce, which I'm sorry, it's not on this one, are uh, one-year separation. So if parties have been separated for one year, they can seek a no-fault divorce. And also mutual consent. If the parties agree to be divorced, they can seek a no-fault divorce. You do not need to be separated for a full year before you file for divorce. It is not necessary to establish that before filing for divorce. So at any point you can be separated for one year and then you can continue and proceed with the divorce, but you do not have to wait until you've been separated that period of time before filing. There are a number of forms we have links in, our, in the PowerPoint to where you can access the forms. Um, for a no-fault divorce that's based on consent, you must file for divorce first, 90 days after the defendant has been given a copy of the complaint. Both parties must file, must sign affidavits acknowledging that yes, they wanna be divorced and they agree to be divorced and they both sign those consents um, so that we can, so that the divorce can then move forward. There are additional waiting periods that are required, but parties can agree to waive those waiting periods. That's that they would sign a waiver of notice to, re, to um, waive that additional 20 day waiting period. And if you have your consent signed and your waiver signed or you've waited the 20 days, you can then move on to request the um, divorce. If there are economic issues, those economic issues will can get dealt with in the interim. Um, I think we're gonna come back to that. Another no fault divorce option is if you've been separated one year. If you separated before December 5th of 2016, it's supposed to be two years, but clearly we are past that two year mark. So no matter what, everyone qualifies under the separation. So. As I said, you can file for divorce before you hit your separation period. You do not need to wait. If it happens to be that when you file for divorce, you are, have already been separated for that, that time frame for a year, at the same time you file for divorce, you can file an affidavit informing the court that you've been separated already for a year. If you, if you haven't had that period, then you can file that at a later time. So whatever point, whatever time you reach that one year separation, you file an affidavit attesting to the fact that you have been, you and your spouse have been separated for a year and that you would like to proceed with the divorce. That affidavit has to be served on the other side. So uh, uh, the complaint has to be served to the other side. The defendant has to get a copy of that and you have to be able to prove the defendant gets a copy of that complaint. The same thing with this affidavit. You have to be able to prove that the defendant receives a copy of this affidavit. The defendant does not need to file anything in response, but they can if they, they could claim that you haven't been separated a year or they could claim that there are economic issues. But if they do not file a counter affidavit, if they do not file um, something contrary to the affidavit, then again, you can proceed with requesting the final decree, uh, divorce decree from the court. Uh, the, the forms are, the link to the forms are referenced on the PowerPoint. Um, and, and I'm sorry, Debbie, has everyone gotten a copy of the PowerPoint or will they? We can send it out to all the attendees. Okay, that absolutely. Way and they can also we, they can also find it on our um, on our website. We'll air this um, after it's it's being recorded currently, so we can we'll post it onto our website, so you can find out all those information then. Great, thank you, Michelle. So, what does it mean when I say that you have to serve someone? So, service is proof that that the individual has received a copy of whatever legal documents they have to get. So there are a number of ways to serve. You can serve it by mail. However, that mail has to be certified mail 
And that green card that you fill out with your certified mail has to specifically say re what's called restricted delivery so that only the person it's directed to can sign for that mail. You can also serve by personal service if you have a friend who is willing to give copies of the complaint and or the affidavit to the, to the other party. Um, that individual can, it can be anyone over the age of 18, but it cannot be the other party. It cannot be the plaintiff. So anyone over the age of 18 can serve by personal service. For those of us who are in private practice, we sometimes hire agencies to take care and do that. Service is not by email. Sending an email does not work. Um, so that would not be considered good service. That being said, if you and your spouse get along, if you're working together and your spouse says, I'll acknowledge I get them, I, I got the paperwork, you can indeed email the paperwork to, the spout, to your spouse, but your spouse would need to sign a paper um, acknowledging that he or she had, has received the paperwork. And then that would be acceptable. The court would find that acceptable if they've acknowledged that they've received it. So you don't have to necessarily pay someone or have someone do that if you are getting along and working and working together. Divorces are a little difficult to get without attorneys. There are a lot of time periods. Um, there's Definitely, there's timing issues. For example, you only have 30 days to serve. You have to wait the 90 days from service for the affidavit. We have the issue about the 20 day waiting period. So sometimes it gets really confusing. So you have to be very careful to pay attention to the timing and the, and the deadlines. Um, we, I, I mean, even as a practicing attorney, if I file a document, if I filed um, something Prior, if I had filed a precipi to transmit before I waited my 20 days, I have had that bounce. So even I have run into problems over the years with timing. So um, it's, it's, there is, um, and I actually don't know if you have that. I have a timeline of how things work. If anyone needs it, I'm happy to share that with them. Um, but, but you need to be careful. You can, you can get a final divorce without ever going into court. It can be a purely paper process. Um, so you don't necessarily ever have to walk into the courthouse, but be careful if you have any economic issues. So if you have issues about support or issues about, and not child support, issues about spousal support or issues about dividing up assets, that has to be dealt with before you are divorced because once you are divorced, those issues are considered moot and resolved and you cannot go back to the family court to seek relief. And so it can get really messy if you haven't addressed the economic issues prior to the divorce being entered, okay? Um, are there any questions related to divorce before we move on? Nope. Okay. Okay. So support. There are diff two different types of support. There's support for a spouse and there is support for a child. When we talk about divorces, that's where we're starting to talk about support for a spouse. Child support is due and owing if you have a kid. It doesn't matter if the parties were ever married. The bottom line is if you have a child, you are responsible to support that child. Under support of a spouse, there are three different kinds, spousal support, alimony, and alimony pendente lite are the three different types of support in terms of spousal support. So spousal support is the support of a spouse that is due and owing whether or not there's been a divorce complaint filed. Spouses have a duty and an obligation to support each other. Um, and so if a party is not being adequately supported by their spouse, I mean, let's say you've separated, but you haven't, but you haven't sought a divorce yet and your spouse is not adequately supporting you, you can seek spousal support without having to file for divorce. So that would be based on the reasonable, reasonable needs of the party who earns less money. Um, and a court would help determine what, how much money is required to support that individual. Alimony is support for a spouse 
that comes after the divorce is final. So alimony is only entered by agreement or if a court has issued an order prior to the parties divorcing. So for any alimony to be paid, the parties must have had to come to that either through a court order or by agreement prior to the entry of the divorce decree. Otherwise there is no alimony obligation. And once a divorce decree is entered, you can't go back and ask for it. Okay. Alimony pendente lite is a fancy way of saying alimony during the pendency of the litigation. So what that means is that while a divorce complaint is pending, before parties are actually divorced, the lower earning spouse is able to seek support from the higher earning spouse. And that is done by a mathematical calculation. So it is based on um, the, uh, the difference in the party's income. It's also dependent on, on if they have children or not. And that is only available during the pendency of the action. And the purpose of it is so that the, um, the lesser earning spouse can, can support herself and defend herself or himself, sorry, I'm saying herself, um, in the litigation during, during the divorce. So those are the three types of support for a spouse during divorce. Child support is not waivable. So as I, as I said, spousal support, if you don't ask for it and you get divorced, you're, you can't get it, it's done. You don't get to go back and ask for it once you are divorced. Child support, however, is an ongoing obligation. In Pennsylvania, it's ongoing until a child is 18 or graduates from high school, whichever comes later, unless the child has special needs. But there is, um, but that obligation ends after graduation of high school or turning of 18, again, whichever is later. Child support is a, again, a mathematical calculation. There are guidelines out there and actually they're all over the web, the internet, you can find them. There's a link, also a link down here, um, but you can find them and, and do a calculation for what the child support is. It's based on the party's net income. It's based on how many children they are. It's based on how many overnights the parents have. Um, and so all that information will get input, it'll be based on uh, extra expenses of the kids. So all that information gets input into a calculator and the calculator spurts out the number. Those numbers are, are reviewed every three years or supposed to be every three, three years um, and are updated in accordance with uh, economic changes in the state of Pennsylvania. So what happens is, uh, the monthly net incomes of the parties are put into the calculator. And what it says is, okay, if the parties were living together and they had two children, and this is how much they were making, they would be spending X amount of dollars every month on the basic needs of their children. Housing, clothing, food, those just basic needs, those kinds of needs. And it comes up with a number for this is what's needed to basically support these children. And then that number is divided in proportion to the party's net income. So let's say one spouse makes $2,000 a month, another makes $1,000 a month, or, and I'm not, I'm sorry, parents, because you don't have to be married. So the, the parent that makes $2,000 a month is responsible for 66% of the expenses, and the spouse that makes $1,000 a month is responsible for one third for 33%. So we take that basic child support number and we divide it between the two parties. That percentage is also then applied to extra needs of the children that are that the parties agree to split or that the court has determined. Typical expenses would include uh, private school tuition, child care that's necessary for the parties to work. Um, Sometimes medical expenses, although a lot of times medical expenses are paid outside the order. Uh, so, and the part, or sometimes the parties can agree to include activities. The parties can also agree to pay for those things outside the order. So uh, they could agree that each is gonna pay their percentage directly to the daycare. They could agree that each is gonna pay their percentage directly to the soccer club, whatever they wanna do. But there are things that then get added into that basic child support amount. The custody schedule will also impact that basic child support amount. Once a parent has at least 40% of overnights, there begins to be a reduction in that basic amount because the assumption is that that parent is providing for the child in their home. 
So now that you have the child 40% of the time, you have your own housing expenses associated with that child. You have your own food expenses and clothing expenses um, that are associated with the child. And so therefore the amount of support will be that, you, that are, is owed to the other party is going to be reduced. I do have to say though, before I move on, and we did talk about this a little bit, um, just because parties have 50-50 does not necessarily mean that a party will not pay child support. That is dependent upon the party's income. If there's a big enough difference in the party's income, it's still possible that with a 50-50 custody case, a party will still owe child support. So we did already talk about um, extra expenses that might be added into child support. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Megan at this point to talk a little bit about the process and procedure in, in the local counties. Right. So this, the, the link here is going to take, I, I think, <laughs> it's going to take people to uh, the forms that, that someone would need to file for child support. Generally, um, even I, I represent people uh, living at or near poverty, and I tell them to find these forms on their own to file with the support office. You don't need the help of an attorney. Um, I know this whole point of this is to do this without the help of an attorney, but people can find these forms on their own and they're pretty easy to fill out either on their own or with the help of somebody from the support office. Um, but then there's gonna be a conference scheduled in front of a conference officer and both Cumberland and Franklin County have the same process that's, that um, the parents will go in uh, and speak with a conference officer and that person takes all of the information that they need, the parents' income, um, any extraordinary expenses, more than likely the parents will get ahead of time some paperwork to fill out and there's an, a request that they bring in. Um, I think it's six months of pay stubs, the previous year's tax um, filings, uh, and then proof of any extraordinary expenses that the parent may have. Um, if the parties can agree at that conference, um, the, then the conference officer will issue an order, uh, print, out an, print out an agreement and have the parties sign it and it will become a court order. Um, and the conference officer is not a judge, and is not actually even an attorney. Uh, they are folks who are employed by the domestic relations office specifically to deal with um, support issues, spousal and child support issues. Um, if there is no agreement at the conference level, this is where Cumberland and Franklin um, are a little bit different from each other. In Cumberland County, um, parties will go in front of a support hearing officer who is an attorney, um, not a judge, but a hearing officer. And the parties will have essentially what looks like a trial. There'll be testimony on the record, parties will give evidence. And that is called, it's a, it's called a de novo hearing, but it means it's brand new. That the information that came before the conference officer previously is not necessarily automatically given at the hearing officer level. So it's it's a brand new hearing. Um, that's different in Franklin County. There, if the parties don't agree at the conference level, the parties will go in front of a judge and we'll have a hearing in front of a judge. Um, if the parties don't agree, one of the parties is not, doesn't agree with the decision of the hearing officer in Cumberland County, then they can file what are called exceptions with the judge. And these aren't, it's not a time to bring in new evidence or make new arguments. Um, it's an opportunity to say why the hearing officer got it wrong, what aspects of the decision the hearing officer got wrong. Those exceptions are filed with the court and heard by a judge. In Franklin County, if a party is not happy with the decision of the judge, it, will, it would be exceptions uh, to the superior court. It, it's, there's, no, there's no other level in between there. Um, if there are not exceptions filed, um, the order will, or the recommendation will become a court order and it will stay in effect um, until 
either one of the parties asks to change it or at the three year review, it's determined that the numbers um, are no longer correct. Thank you. And child support is always modifiable. So it's so the first order that gets entered is not what, what a parent is is stuck with for the rest of that child's life. It's always modifiable, but you need to show that there has been a change in circumstance. So it could be, which could be one party's income changed, one party became unemployed, the child's going to private school, um, the child developed a medical need, you, but you have to show that there's been a change from the, the date of the last order to, to modify the support order, but it remains modifiable until the child is 18 or graduates from high school, which is when the uh, support obligation ends. Are there questions in the chat? Because I'm not checking the chat. I, get, I just had a question. In Philadelphia, is there, um, I think it's interesting that in, in Cumberland County, you do get like an, another level of review versus Franklin County where their level of review is straight to the Superior Court. What, what happens in the Philadelphia, you know, Montgomery, those counties? So Philadelphia and the surrounding counties have the same practice that Cumberland County has, which is you start with a conference officer who is also not a lawyer, um, who will run the numbers. And if the parties don't reach an agreement there, they can go to a hearing officer. I see that we're using the word master in our, in our slideshow. There is actually uh, proposed rule changes to change that to hearing officer because of the connotation of master, which I'm I can't believe it took us this long to get there, but we're finally there. So, um, so yeah, so in, in, in Philly and the surrounding counties, um, after the conference level is a hearing, a hearing officer where that is your de novo hearing, as Megan said, where all the evidence is given, testimony is taken, and a recommendation is issued. And if you don't like that recommendation, you, have a, you would file exceptions and go to the judge. Um, in Franklin County, I just want to note that it is difficult I mean, appeals to the Superior Court are not easy. They're time consuming, expensive and difficult. So I would imagine that not a lot of uh, support cases end up actually getting appealed from the judge's decisions in Franklin, I would assume. I would assume that's correct. I haven't been there recently enough to know if that's happening on any kind of regular basis or not. Are there other questions about the support procedure? Okay. Um, oh. so okay. There was a question um, about how long a spouse is entitled to receive support for okay. spousal support. For spousal support, okay. So uh, that depends. It's <laughs> the easiest answer, it depends. So with spousal support that could potentially be entered before a divorce is even filed, I've seen them go on for years. But part of that is because the parties just don't ever do anything about it. They don't file to modify, they don't file a divorce. But filing a, getting a divorce decree will end both spousal support and APL. So if you have either one of those running, you get a divorce decree and that is gonna end that support. So that the only support that's possible after the entry of a divorce decree is alimony, which as I've said, is only gonna happen if you have a court order or if the parties have agreed. Um, APL also is very time limited because it's only during the pendency of the litigation. There are circumstances in which you can file to end APL before uh, a divorce decree is entered, but for the most part, a divorce decree is going to end that period of support under spousal support and APL. Alimony is, is even usually negotiated or it's court ordered and it will always have some time frame, um, which will be determined by the courts based on a number of factors. And a lot of that also has to do with what the assets and equitable distribution looks like. And equitable distribution is the term that we use for how the parties divide their assets. Um, and so a lot of courts will balance the assets that the parties have with support. Um, and so it's very, very case specific when we talk about alimony. Anything else? Okay. All right, so let's talk about custody. 
So there are two uh, legal terms for custody. One is legal custody and one is physical custody. So legal custody is about the right to be, to participate in making decisions, major life decisions for the children. So education, where do they go to school? What religion are they raised? Should they get a vaccine? Should they have surgery, like medical decisions? Um, and right now you can imagine that there's a lot of talk these days about vaccines and medical choices. Um, and, and those are legal custody decisions. Legal custody can either be shared where both parents have to participate and they both have a right to have a say, or it can be sole, where only one parent is making that decision and the other parent does not have the right to, to be involved in that decision making. In general, I would say 95% of cases are shared legal custody. It is, it's pretty severe for a court to order sole legal custody. And that would happen, that would arise if a parent has really shown an inability to, um, to meet the child's needs, to severely not be able to work with the other parent or makes really, really, really bad decisions. So but in the majority of cases, the large majority of cases, it's shared legal custody. The other type of custody we talk about is physical custody. So that's what most people think about when they think about custody. Physical custody is where is a child at any given moment, right? Where is, wh whose house is he sleeping in? Who has the right to have that child with them? So primary physical custody is when a child sleeps with one parent more than 50% of the time. And I'm gonna use overnights because we really have knocked down custody to counting overnights. We do it for child support. When I say to you, you know, if a parent has more than 40% of overnights, uh, there starts to be a reduction in support. So we really count overnights. So primary custody is when a child sleeps at a parent's house more than 50% of, of the time. So that's, uh, more, that's 183 or more overnights during the course of a year. And partial custody is for a parent where the child sleeps less than 50% of the time. So less than 182 overnights during the course of the year. Shared custody is when the parties have equal custody. Uh, so a totally equal amount of, of time. That could look like a week on week off. It could look like what we call a 223 or 225 schedule where the parties like alternate weekends and one party always has Monday, Tuesday, and one party always has Wednesday, Thursday. But basically it breaks down to, in general, in a two week period, each parent gets seven overnights. Visitation, which a lot of people throw around and don't realize that the legal definition of visitation in Pennsylvania is supervised custody. So it's supervised visitation. So when lawyers use visitation in, in our world, we mean that that time is supervised. So which happens in extreme circumstances in cases, for example, of abuse, um, or if a parent has a significant drug or alcohol problem, in those cases, it is appropriate to, to have supervised visitation. Um, Megan, do you wanna take it from here? Sure. Um, so again, uh, and actually I was gonna say, uh, there are a couple of websites uh, at least for Cumberland County, I'm not seeing on Franklin County that there are forms available online, but in Cumberland County, there are forms. It's ccpa.net. So Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, ccpa.net. Uh, and there are under the prothonotaries link, different, different uh, forms that parents can use or that parties can use. Um, Franklin County's website, I'm not seeing it, but uh, it's Franklin County, all spelled out one word, PA. Dot gov. <clears throat> um, but for either county uh, to, to begin any kind of custody action, there needs to be a complaint filed. And um, at that point in Cumberland County, once the complaint is filed, um, it'll trigger a scheduling for a custody conciliation in front of someone called a conciliator, who is an attorney that's been appointed by the court to essentially what people think of is, is mediation or negotiate between the parties. Um, and then the, the, that person's goal and that person's directive from the court is to work as hard as possible to get the parties to agree to something. Um, and in Cumberland County, and I think probably across the state, more and more we have, we're seeing that the conciliators are um, 
proposing an, a, 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 an agreement to try for three months or six months and then come back and see how it's working. And I think that part of the reason for that is that parties are very scared to agree to something that they think is going to be long term, even though custody is never set in stone. Uh, and But if they understand that in three or six months they could come back for a follow up conciliation, maybe they're more willing to try it out. And in that time frame might be able to work out some of the kinks or decide it, it's working very well. Um, so the hope and the goal of a conciliation is that a, a court order will, will come from it that the parties can work with. Um, if it can't, then the conciliator will refer the case to a judge for a hearing. And uh, the hearings in Cumberland County um, are getting scheduled for either half or full day hearings. And usually that decision is made uh, based on a recommendation from the conciliator about how complex the issues are. Um, there are hearings that last more than one day. Those are pretty rare. Uh, and there's, there usually need to be some very significant issues for a judge to agree to have a hearing that goes on for more than one day in a custody action. Um, Franklin County, again, is a little bit different in this. When a complaint gets filed in, in Franklin County, that will be scheduled to be heard in front of a judge within the, I, I believe it's within the next, within 10 days, and it might be within seven days of filing the complaint. And it is for a very, very fast filing, and it's called a presentation in front of the judge where the parties will let the judge know what is currently happening in the case and the judge to set the status quo. Um, in an order. If there is no status quo, if the parties are, are, if it's a new baby and there hasn't been something happening, or if it's a brand new separation and they don't have a status quo happening, the judge will likely order something based on that very quick five to 10 minute presentation. And then that order will stay in place until there is a conciliation. Um, and those are, you, they're supposed to happen within 20 days of uh, the initial, be scheduled within 20 days of the initial filing. Um, and then from that, the procedure between both counties looks very similar. The conciliation is meant to get an agreement. And if it doesn't, then it goes um, to a hearing in front of a judge. One Megan, of the things- are there, oh. are there judges that are devoted to family court in Franklin County and Cumberland County, or are they sort of, they do a lot of different types of law? In Cumberland, this is brand new. They are assigning now family court and criminal court judges because we finally have the number of judges here to do that. Um, and it has been, I don't know for Franklin, I'm sorry to say that. I'm not sure uh, because it's been a number of years since I've been there. But I, I, I think, I do have in the back of my head that there are specific judges assigned for family cases also in Franklin County. Um, when I was practicing there, there were not, but I think that they have also, the county has grown. And so there are enough judges now to do that separation. Thank you. One of the things I was gonna mention is that at a conciliation, um, the expectation is that parties should be open to negotiate and the, the proposals or the offers given at a conciliation are not to be, are, it's not, it's expected that those remain in the conciliation. If it doesn't work out, one party can't use that as a bargaining chip within the hearing itself. And I think that's sometimes difficult for parties to remember um, that even though a party offered one thing at a conciliation, it doesn't mean it's on the table when, when they get to a hearing. Just by way of comparison, let me tell you that in Philadelphia County, because we have such a large volume, we do have, I think we're up to 12 judges just sitting in domestic relations. I can't remember now if it's 12 or 13. And, um, and unless you ask for more time, you basically get 20 to 40 minutes on your custody petition, unless you've specifically filed a petition asking for more time. So things go, and 
by the way. We don't get scheduled for those for months out. So, um, so in so things are work very differently in Philadelphia County because of sheer volume. Yeah, that is. I don't. We don't have twelve judges total. <laughs> and so, why don't you explain why people have to go to Philadelphia County, for example, versus you know Cumberland County versus Franklin County? Oh, you know, I, I couldn't just file in Cumberland County because it right. goes faster. So a case has to be filed in the county where a child has lived for the previous six months. And if a child has moved uh, recently and it hasn't been six months, the expectation is that the hearing, the, the matter will be heard in the previous county. In the situation where it's a baby and it's not six months old, it'll be where the child has resided most of the time. The difference for this would be if there's an abuse situation and somebody is fleeing with the child uh, for safety purposes. And then it might be in the county where the, where the parent is with the child. And then that county that enters an order retains jurisdiction unless the parties, everybody leaves or the party asks for it to be moved because there, it's a more convenient forum in another location, the, 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 the family has now moved someplace else. Um, I was gonna answer Chelsea's question, um, how parents should prepare for the conciliation. Do they need to bring anything or have their attorney present? Certainly if they have an attorney, I think it makes sense to bring an attorney with them. Um, but do keep in mind that at conciliations, at least in Cumberland and Franklin, nobody besides an attorney can come in. So parents can't bring their, their mom or their neighbor or their cousin to help them, or especially a new boyfriend or girlfriend <laughs> is not allowed to come in to help with um, advocating. Uh, so if, if, the, if the parent doesn't have an attorney with them, they're going to be coming in on their own. And there's no, um, although they can bring paperwork with them, there's not their, um, on the record testimony or exhibits. So a conciliator can look at at school records or therapist notes, if they would ever get them, but that would be strange. Um, but they're not, it's not going to be uh, evidence that's presented to the court in any way. Oh, and just to clarify, that's because the evidence, the time to present the evidence really is when you get in front of the judge. That is where the testimony will be taken. It'll be on the record. Evidence can be shared. Um, just so that there's no confusion, this slide that you're looking at now is, is very much focused to Philadelphia County where I talked about, for example, you know, you pretty much get 20 minutes before a judge. Because of our, um, because of how many people there are, we have avenues to get in faster. This, this is not a problem apparently in Cumberland and Franklin counties. Um, and so there are various petitions and procedures that we have in Philadelphia. So I'm just going to skip over this if I can. I will jump in. If, the, if there are situations where uh, an emergency petition may need to be filed, um, and that's the, the, the rule that I follow with this uh, is if the safety of the child, if the child is not getting medication that he or she needs, is not able to get in the, the parent snatch the child and is not taking them to school, um, or there's some other um, emergent safety concern for the child. Or, or a child snatching issue would be, would fall under that category. And that's probably about the same across the board, I would say in all counties, at least the counties I practice in. So custody, by the way, is also always modifiable. The question for custody is what is in the best interest of the child? So unlike support, you don't have to prove a change of circumstance to follow, file a modification of custody. All you need to say is it would be in the best interest of the child or children if custody is changed in this way and why. Um, so there are, the statute includes factors for how a judge can, can determine what is in the best interest of the child. And these factors are, they're here identified here. I'll just briefly go through them. Um, so which parent is more likely to permit continued contact between the child and the other party? Has there been abuse by a party or a member of the party's household? 
uh, what what is each parent doing to help parent the child in their daily routines, uh, the need for stability in education, family, and community life, whether there is extended family, what the relationship with siblings are, if the child has a preference. Now, let me speak to that just a little bit because everybody always asks, at what age can my, my, can my kid tell the judge that, he does, that she doesn't wanna live with dad anymore, right? So, first of all, uh, many judges won't talk to the kids until they're at least six. And there are judges I know that won't even talk to them until they're in the double digits. Um, the child has to be, has to understand the difference between a lie and a truth, or there's just no point in the judge talking to them. They have to be pretty mature and be able to express themselves. Um, of course, as children get older, and I'm talking older, teenage years. So maybe around the age of 14. What happens in this factor is this factor starts to weigh a little bit more heavily than other factors. It's still just one factor. A judge is not going to make a decision just based on what a child says. But as children get older, they'll might put more weight in what a child says if they find the, the what the child is talking about to be credible and mature and based on you know, reasonable factors and what they actually see um, in terms of the rest of the hearing. So there will never be a time that what the kid says is what's gonna go. No, there is no judge that's gonna say the kid can make the decision and that's it. But it does become a stronger factor as they became older and are able to articulate why it is that they might like something or another. Um, did you wanna add anything to that, Megan? Um, just to say that I, I, and I don't know that this is county specific, it might just be judge specific, but I have seen more and more where parents, when they want to have a judge speak to the child, the judge is more likely to appoint a guardian ad litem to talk to the child and have that person give a report to the court, or if necessary, in a, uh, no, not in custody, we're not going to have an attorney for the, judge, for the child, um, but potentially a GAL. Oh, that's fantastic. I wish we were doing that in Philly. So just, and just so those of you who are tuning in, a GAL is a guardian ad litem. Their job is to represent the best interests of the child. So they get to talk to the child, meet with the child, talk to, talk to teachers and school professionals, maybe mental health professionals that are involved. They get to get the picture of what's going on in this child's life. And their role is not to represent the child as an attorney would, but to represent the best interests of the child. And so they actually get to offer an opinion about what they think is best for the child. Um, and so GALs in many cases are extremely helpful because they have the time and ability to really get into that child's life and know what's going on with him or her. Okay, back to the factors. Um, courts will consider if an parent is attempting to turn a child against the other parent. Um, they look at which child tends to, attends to the needs of, which parent is attending to the needs of the child more. Um, if, if there's one party that is maintaining like a love, loving and stable relationship, does one child really, has really been bonded with one parent? Does he see just one parent as the source of support? They consider how far apart the parties live. Um, is there appropriate child care? Are the parties communicating with each other? Is there a history of drug and alcohol abuse? Is there a mental or physical, um, mental health or physical condition of a parent or a household member? Are there criminal charges and convictions? There's a whole list of um, criminal charges and convictions a court must consider if a parent or a household member has been um, convicted or charged with. Uh, the court will look at the parenting plans and the proposals by the parties and then any other relevant factor, which is obviously very case specific. So, you know, a judge has these 18 um, factors that all have to be weighed and balanced. And in many cases, they're pretty much equal um, to each other. And so there are, there are, it's difficult for a judge in many cases to decide how should this really work. So I will tell you that judges would love when parties reach agreements outside of court and both with custody and support, you can absolutely reach agreements outside of court. We draft them and file them with the court and the court will help you do that because there is no one who knows your kid better than you. 
And so really the best situation is for you and the other parent or grandparent, because you may be involved in like a grandparent case, to come to a, a, an agreement on what is best for your kid. Because you know your kid way better than a judge is ever going to get to know the kid. Okay, so go ahead. I was going to say, before you go to the next slide, you know, there's a few factors, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, you know, criminal convictions, you know, and, and how does the judge take somebody's word or does the judge expect some kind of proof or expert testimony? How does that work? So I will say in my experience and where I work out of, um, first of all, when it comes to criminal convictions, you can find that information in Pennsylvania. It's available um, on, on the internet. You can, you can look up if people have been charged or convicted of, of convictions. So you have access as does the court to that. And now parties are required to, to sign an affidavit identifying if either they or someone in their household has been charged or convicted with certain with certain convictions. There is a form that must be completed and filed with every custody complaint um, so that the court knows that there's a, if there's a history there. In terms of drug or alcohol or mental or physical condition, I will say that's really left up to the parties um, for a party to raise that as being an issue. And if a party doesn't raise it as being an issue, then uh, judges are not going to, on their own, start investigating those issues unless they get an inkling, like somebody's behaving really erratically in court, and so they so there's a concern about a mental health issue. But otherwise, it really is up to the parties to raise that uh, that as an issue. And let me give a caveat to that. So let's say, you know, parties are in there; they're 35 years old. They're arguing about the custody of their 10 year old, and mom raises the fact that dad, when he was 18, was like a heavy pot smoker. That's not going to go very far, right? I mean, we're talking about years and years ago. Um, the court is really concerned about what's going on now and what's going on for the child now and what's in, in the best interest of the child now. So I tell my clients, if we're talking about something, certainly if we're talking about something that happened before the child was born, you chose to have a kid with this guy. You can't now say that, that, that it's a problem that this happened before you had this kid, right? So certainly that's off the record. And then the rest of it has to be reasonable. So if we're talking about a 10 year old, probably something that happened even when they were two is not gonna be relevant unless you can show a continued um, pattern of conduct. So you really have to, it, it's, it's a balancing act and it's really very case dependent. Did you wanna add anything, Megan? Nope, I, that's exactly the situation here. And it, it's, that's hard for people because I think parents, when they're in a custody battle, they're looking for any bad thing that the other side has, and the court's not doing the same thing. <laughs> so we are almost out of time. Um, so I didn't know if there were any questions from anyone and they wanna put them into the chat. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can see everybody. And okay, so, that. well, there aren't any, so you're okay. Uh, <laughs> So I think, you know, I just, we are at 729. I think this was an amazing presentation. The time went by quickly and it was, it, and I really appreciate the personalness of the, of the presentation. So thank you both very much. And uh, this will be available on pmconline.org's web, website. And I think we may make a few changes to the slideshow before we put that up. <laughs> Sorry, dog. That, no worries. <laughs> that's a it's perfect called Zoom ending. life. <laughs> that's, that's a perfect ending. All right. Well, everybody, have a great night and thank you very much. Thank you, Shippensburg Koi Library. Thank you, Megan. Thank, thank you, Megan. Thank you so much, Megan. Yep. Thank you all.